Okay, go to the next one. <clears throat> Um, the aquaculture industry, we usually talk about fish, but it actually includes anything that you can grow in the water or in a water environment. Uh, but I'm typically going to talk about fish here. Uh, and even at that, we have a broad perspective to go through. We, uh, I should preface this whole thing by saying I'm from Wisconsin, and I typically deal with the northern central tier of states. So what I have to do with um, managing water and effluence and so forth is probably going to be quite different than East Coast, West Coast, or the Southern states. But up in the Northern tier, we have uh, access to cold water, cool water, warm water fish. Uh, we can have fish and plant combinations like uh, aquaponic situations. We have uh, people that just have uh, plants growing uh, hydroponics with no fish. Uh, if we do outdoor culture, We've got a lot of variety there, uh, the whole pond. Maybe you can have net pens, cages, floating raceways, pond, tide, pond side tank culture. We have flow through systems that are indoor and we have recirculating aquaculture systems which are called uh, RAS. And I'll use RAS quite frequently so I don't have to repeat it. But that's a system that's indoors that recycles all the water and never wastes it uh, to the outdoors. And we also get into saltwater systems, like uh, right now we're starting to get into shrimp. So just uh, to break down what we are growing. Oh, and then the other thing I wanted to mention, about 90% of the aquaculture in Wisconsin that we consider aquaculture is actually bait fish. Uh, and then there's uh, the next 9% is growing trout, and the last 9% is all the other species, uh, the last 1%. And uh, so I'm just going to go through what we actually culture for food fish, and that will apply to bait fish if they're doing culture, an intense culture, and so forth. So we have non-indigenous cold water species that we're working with, uh, Atlantic salmon, Arctic char are new. Rainbow trout is the standby. That's not uh, an indigenous species, but it, it seems like it's because it's so cosmopolitan. Then we get into what we call cool water. Uh, walleye, sogai, perch. Sogai is actually a hybrid walleye sauger, um, and it looks the same as a walleye, so I'm just going to put one picture up. But those are cool water fish, and then the next slide will show, uh, and both uh, these are indigenous, and then the indigenous fish in this picture is your bluegill, which is pretty cosmopolitan. But if we want to uh, go indoors to a real warm water species, we start with tilapia, which is normal aquaponics and we have shrimp. Um, there's, there's a rule of, of, uh, that I always use in managing uh, fish culture. Um, what we have to realize is that we're actually doing two resources. One is your biological organism that we're managing, and that's what we're thinking of managing, and then the other one is, the big one is the water. So any successful aquaculture is really an exercise in wastewater treatment. And as long as you can provide good water quality, your fish or any other organism you're working with will be happy and you will have a su successful operation. So when we consider the cool and warm water species in the northern tier states, uh, we, can, we can raise them, but we're really limited by maybe three to four months at the, at the tops, uh, walleye maybe a little longer. If we go to cold water species where we, we're talking about trout and salmonids, uh, we're either using artesian or well water, and, and obviously they're cold water, so they, their growing season is quite a bit longer. And for indoor systems, we're generally working with temperatures that are 65 to 80 degrees, usually on the higher end, and that's in an RAS system, your recirculating aquaculture system. And by uh, and some of these species are definitely warm water. They cannot be grown outdoors. Uh, the types of waste that we get, uh, we generally will get a solid waste from the fish, and that's our feces, and we're, it's very obvious. If you raise fish in an aquarium, you'll see that. But an additional waste comes from our operations if we're feeding food, which we always do if we want them to grow. Uh, but that food, if we overfeed, that is an excess solid waste and that could be more uh, more biological oxygen demand uh, that could be more demanding than the feed it's, uh, than the fish feces itself and we also have uh, uh, dissolved waste coming from the fish 
usually from the gills, that's on nitrogenous waste, pneumonia, and that has to be taken care of. And then if we go back indoors to an RAS system, um, we have to treat both uh, the solid waste and the, uh, um, and the dissolved waste. Uh, typically, an RAS system is self-contained, but we, as we're pulling the waste out of it, we might have to make up about 10% of the, the total volume of the RAS. But all these wastes are oxygen-consuming entities, and they have to be, uh, that, that waste has to be solved. So let's go to the treatment of waste uh, in the outdoor systems for pond. The big treatment is going to be aeration. There's almost nothing else you can do. Um, and if you're in a pond, whether it's a cage or in a pond proper, aeration is going to be uh, mandatory, especially when we get to the, uh, the warmer temperatures of July and August. And the farther south you go, the more that becomes a bigger problem. Um, sometimes if you're using floating raceways, static raceways, or on-site tanks, the flow is sufficient to eliminate the need for oxygenation, but it has to be there as a standby. Indoor systems, we have some flow-through systems, but generally not. Most of them are closed-loop systems, and they require a more sophisticated waste treatment system. You, know, you start with solids removal, and then you have a second step for the dissolved solid and gaseous waste, which would be uh, basically uh, converting ammonia to nitrates, and that's a biological process. And I'll talk a little bit about the complications of that later. So I put a couple pictures in. Uh, for those that, I mean, I think you know most of what I've been talking about, except these slides are of what I have as uh, my pond site tank culture. The ones on the left are the low profile, and I use those for spawning eggs, uh, feed training fry and fingerling uh, uh, size grading. But then the next year when I go, I have the bigger tanks for the grow out and basically you're starting with, like these are for perch. And if I'm starting with a four inch perch, I'll go to the grow out in four months. So that's, that's the setup for that. And notice that here's the grow out tanks. And then this is a, this is actually a solids collection tank. So that's one of the things I do. So there's no solids collection in here, but there's no solid waste uh, accumulating there either. And this is a little odd for our part of the country, but this is a shrimp uh, uh, tank a setup. Uh, a lot of, and this is about 80 degrees. Uh, and this is just in a, a large uh, uh, pole barn. And this, uh, the one on the right, is a small aquaponics. You have the fish tank, a little uh, degassing tanks uh, for ammonia treatment, and then you have uh, that's converted to nitrates, which is used by the plants, and that's. A very small unit would be in a high school or maybe your basement. So not nothing real big. There is obviously uh, there are very large systems when they get into aquaponics. Okay, so let's talk about the physical parameters and what are the most important parameters to look for. Uh, the one that drives everything. I talked a lot about oxygen and reoxygenation, and the one thing about oxygen is that it's all temperature related. Uh, oxygen saturation is the highest at uh, low temperatures, and you lose saturation the higher the temperatures are. That's why we have so much problem holding oxygen in July and August. Uh, then there we have to put a lot of aeration in the in a system, and conversely, in the winter time we don't may not aerate at all. Uh, the rate of a waste treatment occurs much faster with warm temperatures. Again, as the warmer uh, temperatures occur, then we get uh, oxygen eaten up a lot faster because the waste treatment occurs faster. Um, oxygen consumption by fish and the waste digestion is significantly lower in cold temperatures, which would be winter, which is most of the time up here, and uh, the cool uh, spring and fall is cool. So very little um, oxygen demand, or, or I should say extensive oxygen demand in the middle of summer, but not so in the rest of the time. Uh, indoor systems, um, generally they're, they're really warm, uh, but sometimes they go with a cold water fish, and it's, it's important to know, this is critical right here, uh, the rate of, of converting ammonia to nitrates, which is what you have to do in an indoor system, will be dependent upon your biological treatment system, very uh, much reduced 
uh, in cold temperature. So for working with warm temperatures, it works pretty good, but you have to be cognizant of the fact that it doesn't work, if at all, when it's very cold. Okay, for solids removal, uh, typically we're actually unable to remove solids from an outdoor pond until after a growing season or if we have to take a pond down. There's one other thing I forgot to add in here. Um, a lot of ponds you can do weed harvesting and that's that's a, a reduction in solids, but there you're you're really doing that to uh, pull out uh, the nutrients. And actually, if you let that overwinter, all those plants are going to decompose in your pond and actually be a deficit for oxygen. So that's a, the solids removal where that comes in. Uh, some outdoor situations, as I said before, um, you can remove solids as as are generated, like in. Uh, raceways and flow channels, and specifically in, in pond side tanks, which is what I do. In general, uh, we, we don't have many permits, uh, wastewater permits. Typically, the federal requirements prevail. Um, they're pretty much best management practice for the aquaculture industry. However, uh, the largest discharges may be su subject to wastewater discharge permits. Uh, I think we only have one or two of them in the state of Wisconsin. So that shows you how infrequent uh, a permit is. Everybody's supposed to be under the best management practices. Uh, most states will follow the federal lead with respect to uh, permits. Um, and if you do have a permit, it's going to be based on solids, biochemical oxygen demand, and ammonia. And now most recently, uh, we're seeing new restrictions on phosphorus, and these are very low level, but they're based on uh, basin, uh, whole basin waste load, uh, watershed loading. And so it may be a problem that's 100 miles away, but it starts at your place. So phosphorus is the new kid on the block here. 